You don't know it's good till you get there. Hebrews and then Genesis. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews, yes sir. Um, turn to Hebrews 11 please, yes sir. Thank you. Just for the sake of making mention, and I'm not going to make an analysis, you have some interesting things that are happening now in the Middle East, especially in the nation of Israel, that are noteworthy. I don't intend to preach on it this morning, but I will say keep your eyes to the sky. Amen. Not looking for rockets or missiles or drones, but looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, preacher, do you think it could be? I think it could be any time. Yes, but the events that are occurring there are creating quite a stir. If you're familiar with a little bit of current events, paying attention to that is very important. It brings me to the topic of my subject today. It's a real positive subject. It's called preparing to pass over. Thinking about how we're going to finish. The Apostle Paul got ready to die and he said, I'm now ready to be offered. Jesus Christ said it is finished. Moses, the Bible said, he went up and his natural force was not abated and being 120 years old, neither was his eye dim. And when he got ready to go... He was ready. The Lord let him look over there into Canaan and then buried him and that was the end of life. I wonder how it'll be when it comes to the end of your life. Preacher, why do you talk about it? Well, I don't know. It's probably kind of some things going on right now that at least has made me pause to ponder, to think about. I've lost many friends along the way and it seems to be now you lose more the older you get and I understand that's the progression of life but for a Christian we should be ready to go if the call comes at 25 or 35 or 95 yes, sir. and I think oftentimes we don't prepare ourselves and I'll just give you a few things to ponder to think about notice what he says here my text starts off in uh, Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 21 by faith Jacob when he was a dying blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon his staff. Brother Ernie, you pray, would you, and ask the Lord to help us? Heavenly Father, we do come to you again this morning. I want to thank you, Father, for what we've heard already in Sunday school. Lord, we ask you, Father, that you help our preacher today. Father, we pray that you fill him up. Father, use him for your honor and your glory. Father, we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would touch our hearts. We're so needy this morning. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you just use the preacher once again. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, Father, from what comes out of his mouth to our ear, Father, may it take it and hide it in our hearts. God, we want to just give you praise, honor, and glory for everything that's already going on in, in the rest of the service, Lord. Give you praise and glory for it. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. While you're being seated, come back if you would, please. And come to Genesis chapter number 47. Jacob is a great illustration of individuals that you wouldn't think would be somebody to give a testimony at the end of his life. As a matter of fact, when Jacob is brought up there before, because of Joseph, before Pharaoh, they ask him a question. Pharaoh says, hey, let me ask you something. We've heard a lot of things about you. You're a great progenitor. You're a great uh, uh, head of the nations and the nations of Israel and so on and so forth. You have a dozen sons. You're really quite the individual. Uh, tell us something that will change our lives getting ready. And you know what he says? He says there in Genesis 47, he said 147 years, 130 years at this time, he says, had been the pilgrimage here upon this earth, and few and evil 
have been the years of my pilgrimage. Man, what a thing to come to the end of life being Israel and to have that perception that your life hasn't really amounted to very much at all. You know, oftentimes when we have funerals, we have individuals that come in. The old joke among a lot of preachers is, is that when somebody uh, has lived the wrong way, their statement is, has lived like the devil, it's hard to preach them into heaven come time for a funeral, but you don't speak ill of the dead. But you can't change it once you're dead. The destination has already been determined. Your body will follow at some point in time, whether it winds up being out in eternity in the lake of fire or whether it winds up being at the judgment seat. Once that transpires or takes place, there's no changing that. There's no coming back. You're not going to be the author of a new book that talks about your near-death experience where you went away and then the Lord brought you back because you have unfinished business. Can I just say this about that? It's interesting how many of those people clear declare a special supernatural incident that occurred and rarely do you find them in a church. Rarely do you find them testifying about their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rarely do you find them talking about they need to commit their life more to Jesus Christ. I mean, if you had a real near-death experience, would you agree with me that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it changed Paul's life? If you really had that experience, wouldn't you agree that maybe instead of a book or a movie deal, that maybe it ought to be about setting an example and being in church and reading the Bible? I mean, wouldn't that make it more real to know I've been there and seen it? And I'm telling you, it's real. The latest one that I read was a guy who has now become a social misfit. Nobody in his family wants anything to do with him. None of his friends want anything to do with him. He's so disconnected from everything else. All he does is keep going back and reiterating about the time that he went to hell for a while and then went up to heaven for a while. And the Lord supernaturally spoke to him. And now all he does is just sit and reminisce over that on a regular basis and occasionally write an article. No church, no Bible, no witnessing, no testimony, no nothing. Just can't wait to to get where I was. Well, if you really saw Jesus, you'd probably be out there like the Apostle Paul going right back into Lystra and passing out tracts because you want to get back to where you came from instead of sitting there a recluse. But I wondered about this man, Jacob. I mean, if you pause and ponder and think about it, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that happened in his life that none of us would pick out or we would choose to say... He's a good role model to look at. But God's interesting. He doesn't take one little portion of things in your life and make a whole lifetime out of it. You know what He does? He looks at how you finish. No matter what you might have done up until this point now, you still have time to finish right. I thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. I thank God that He is not uh, considered me to be mistake proof. I thank God that He gives me an opportunity that first and foremost I would like to say Jake had some good experiences in his past. There were some positive things that happened. I mean, remember in spite of the fact that he, uh, he horse traded his way into the blessing... In spite of the fact that he lied to his daddy, in spite of those things, when he took off that night at mama's instruction, you got to admit that it must have been supernatural and something special for him to be putting his head upon a rock and seeing angels ascending and descending and saying, surely God is in this place. You got to admit that that would uh, be a past thing that occurred that made you pause and ponder, man, God was good to me in spite of my foolishness. And he goes over there, and I mean, the first girl he meets, he makes him, she makes him cry. I mean, I've seen some ugly people make you cry before, but uh, apparently when he goes over there, he immediately falls head over heels with this girl, and the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and he wept. Man, you talk about a romance story. And he winds up meeting her, and then he gets deceived, and winds up working for that girl 14 years because he can't be distracted from the fact that he loved her so much. Can you imagine what that must be like? Wouldn't you agree that that might be a good thing? Can I ask you this question? Do you have any Ebenezer stones in your life? 
Do you ever have anything, some things that, that, that as you draw closer to the end of your life, do you have anything that you can look back and lean on? I mean, when you go through a dark valley now, have there been some times where you've been in a dark valley where the Lord was the light of that valley? Have there been some times where you were really low but the lily of the valley showed up? The rose of Sharon, Samian, and Manip Have you ever realized that sometimes in spite of the mistakes you made, the sins that you have committed, the stuff that you've done, that seems to be ever in front of you. In spite of that, hasn't God still been good? Amen. Hadn't God done some supernatural things? I mean, He can go back and look on all the herds and stuff that the Lord blessed Him with. Gave him the ability to go out there and take ring straight and, and take pieces of popular and peel them off and put them in front of the water. I don't even know how somebody would come up with that except it was supernatural. And everybody else thought that those animals were not good and they were the best of the best because God gave him supernatural intervention and blessed him and blessed his herds and blessed his flocks. Man, he really had a pretty good life while he was in captivity. And then eventually led to him breaking away. And as soon as he broke away, he's supposed to go meet his brother Esau, but he has a wrestling match out in the cornfield. Yeah. Yep. I know it sounds bad, but God meant it for good. Amen. And he latched on and he said, Bless me, I'm not going to turn you loose. Which is just like Jacob. Yep. In spite of his way of doing things, do you realize that it's not until he's nearly 130 years of age that he finally realizes few and evil have been the pilgrimage of the years of my life? That for all the rest of the time he thought everything he was doing was okay? I wonder how it'll be when you and I pass off the scene. I wonder how it'll be as the sun begins to dip behind the horizon if you could hold your life up there as the brightness of that sun gets ever brighter as it begins to be eclipsed by the earth there and it begins to dip behind the horizon and your life comes up there before you. I wonder if that will be said of you. Will it be said few and evil have been the years or will it be, Lord, you sure have been good to be in spite of me. Jacob, in spite of what you might think, he might have walked with a limp from there on, but at least he had a wrestling match with God. Amen. That had to have been something noteworthy in his life. I would think if he was looking at Ebenezer stones, I would think that if he was looking at things in the past to give him encouragement in the present, I would think that he would look back and say, yeah, that was a pretty rough time, man. I walked with a limp the rest of my life, but how many people can say you wrestled with God and only came out with a limp? But you know what that limp caused him to do? It caused him not to be able to walk without leaning on something. Can I say this to you? You're not going to be successful in making it to the end unless you have something to lean on. Amen. You need a relationship first and foremost with our Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not going to make it to the end. You say, why? You're already walking with a handicap, whether you recognize it or not. We're all crippled with a sin nature. We all by nature do not want to do what God tells us to do. And we have been bound by that thing. And in order for us to get there where we're going to, we're going to have to learn to lean upon the Lord. Yes. Not always an easy thing to do, would you agree? Certainly wasn't an easy thing for Jacob to do. I don't know about you, but have you ever paused to ponder to think about what he must have thought when Rachel died? You ever thought how that life might have passed before him when after Rachel died, those boys wound up killing Joseph or that he thought were, was dead that they sung about? You ever thought not only how Joseph must have felt abandoned by his family, by his friends, and by God himself, but even though the Bible teaches us that he said, the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him. Can you imagine how Jake felt about that? To have those sins kind of be called to remembrance. And listen, if you have any character about you at all, when your sin affects other people, you naturally think, this is my fault. I've done something that is created or something that has caused this to happen to other people. And I know you're not a vicarious atonement or a vicarious suffering for other people, but the fact of the matter is, sin does affect other people. Amen. And sometimes they pay a greater price than we do. And I can't imagine when those boys brought that goat skin back there with that blood on it, I imagine that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that mind went back and he said, you know what, I did the same thing. 
I put goat skins on me and I deceived my daddy, not knowing that down the road I'm going to have my favorite son, the one whom I made a coat of many colors for, is going to be taken away from me. You see, when we start the journey, we don't consider how it can be midway or even at the end. Hindsight is always 2020. He met and married the love of his life. It cost him a little bit along the way. But can I ask you this question? Have you ever seen God deliver you from things in the past? And instead of being at all about what you did wrong, could you just praise the Lord that He got you through whatever that might have been? Can you just thank God that I'm not where I could have been? Can I say this? If we were really honest and we believe what the Bible says about us and about our sin nature, had we not gotten saved, there literally is nothing that we may not have become without God stepping in and intervening in our life. If there's ever a reason to praise the Lord, it is. Not what I used to be, but what I am now. Not where I might have been, but where I'm going now. And in spite of everything that I might have done, I made that decision the right way. And God has done some things for me in my life, including helping me overcome the sins of the past. Amen. If you don't hear anything else I say today, please hear this. If God's forgiven you, why can't you forgive yourself? Yes, Stop walking around and bearing a burden that has already been paid for. Trying to pay for something that you cannot pay for. It is finished. It is under the blood. It is as far as the east is from the west. It is in the depths of the sea. It is behind his back. He remembers it no more. Stop trying to let the guilt monkey ride you to the grave. Stop talking about the previous marriage and the previous job and the previous jail sentence and the previous drug addiction and the previous drinking and the previous whatever. Stop it! Amen. It's under the blood. Thank God for what you have now. Amen. Praise the Lord that we have something to consider. Have you ever just paused to ponder in spite of the path that you were on? Look where you are now. And ponder where you could have been. Listen, Jake made some mistakes. He did some things that were bad and wrong to do. Some things that were sinful. But ladies and gentlemen, the world and the devil want to keep reminding you of things that you cannot change. There is nothing you can do about the last 15 minutes. Brother Sam's up here leading the song, Nearer My God to Thee. And ladies, I enjoyed hearing you singing. But those men started singing. And that, that was, had kind of a, a calming, sort of a, a deeper tone to it. It was solemn, but there was a lot of safety. There was a lot of security. And I'm thinking, if we were really as near as we claim to be, we wouldn't have time to be looking and talk about where we used to. Yes. To be. Amen. Where I used to be is easy preaching. It doesn't require any effort on my part. All it requires is me to just look back. You know what's strange is when I look back, I have to work at finding the good things. But you know what occludes my vision? Eclipse? You know what prevents me from seeing it? As soon as I look back, the bad things are right there. I mean, they're right there. It's like, could you get out of the way? I just want to, I have to work at replacing those things. Can I just help you with that? Stop talking about it. Stop wandering, just staying around. I wonder what if, and if I hadn't have done that, I, you did it. It's done. You can't change it. You can have a lot happier Christian life. You say, what will happen when somebody comes up? Listen, they came to the Apostle Paul. And he's up there preaching in front of Felix and Agrippa. And man, I am glad y'all are up here. This is a blessing. This is a great way to start a marriage. This is the best form. I told them, best form of marriage counseling sitting on the front row. Here they are. Amen. Oh, that the whole church would be that way. Yeah. I'd just like to have a church full of front rows. <laughs> Say, does your church ever have people on the front row? Yes, yeah, all we got is just front rows. <laughs> but listen, the Apostle Paul's preaching... 
the great, the swan song, the, the final time that he's going to be preaching before he gets offered. He's there finally in front of Felix and Agrippa. And they say to the Apostle Paul, you're a murderer. You've killed all these people and done all these things. He hesitates. He doesn't be like, well, you don't understand the circumstances. I was a different person and all that. You know what Paul said? You're right. I'm guilty of all that. But that was before I met Jesus. And what I don't want to do is get sidetracked talking about the reasons and why I get... Trust me when I tell you, burned into his mind is every execution he attended, including Stephen's. He could give you every intricate detail, every splatter of blood, every rock that was thrown. He could give you the thread count on the coat he was holding when Stephen was stoned. But instead of getting hijacked by his past, he said, that was true, but I met Jesus. And he turns that entire conversation, catches him off guard, doesn't even try from a legal standpoint to even come at him and try to give a legal recourse. He just simply uses it for his opportunity to give him the gospel. Man, I saw a light above the brightness of the sun. And I realized, man, I was the one that was at fault. And when he said, Lord, it is hard for thee to, uh, Paul, it's Saul's hard for thee to kick against the prick. I said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? You know what their response was? They didn't any longer bring up his past, the accusations. Felix says, almost thou persuadest me. Man, almost. You ain't ready to die. Paul's like, I'm freer than y'all are. Paul, how are you doing? Oh, I think myself happy. <laughs> Paul, are you insane? Nope. I'm in the perfect will of God. I'm freer than you are. Well, except for these chains, I would that you were as I am. I'm in prison and I'm free and I'm shackled and I'm free. Can I ask you a question as we get ready to pass from this life to the next? Can the past sometimes be utilized to help us to do better in the present? I mean, why continue to repeat the same bad mistakes? Thank God for the forgiveness and then can we move on? I mean, what's the point of keeping termite-eating timbers in the household? If we're going to clear the foundation, let's clear the foundation. Let's rebuild it the right way. Let's fix it where every time a storm comes, it doesn't come tumbling down on top of us. I got to thinking about Moses when he got ready to go up the hill at the end. He's a great illustration. When he gets ready to die, he's going up at the end and he's still serving the Lord, going against gravity. You know all the points that are in there. And God's still talking to him. But here's the great thing. At the end of his life, he's still listening. Did you get that? He never quit listening. Now, you know what he could have said? He could have said, man, I remember the time when the Lord told me one thing and I did something else. Right. He could have said, you know, I'm going to wind up being judged for what I did one time because I hit the rock and was told to speak to the rock. But that's not what he did. He's still listening and God's still talking. I've learned this about the Lord. He doesn't keep talking if we don't listen. Amen. Why would he? It's an amazing thing to come to what I believe is probably the most significant event in your human life, how it ends. We all have an idea in our mind how it's going to end. I mean, haven't you kind of thought about it at times? Well, I'm going to die. I'm going to be like 98 years old and I'm going to be, you know, doing good one day and I'm going to lay on the bed. I'm going to have time to say goodbye to everybody and, and then to and they're going to go back and talk about what a wonderful life it's been and make a movie about it and, and so on and so forth. And then I'm just going to ease on out. The Lord's going to send some angels to gather me up and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but you don't know that. I mean, you heard about the bigger barns. He's going to build bigger barns because he thinks next year's harvest is going to be so much. i got to have bigger barns. And the Lord's like, you fool, I'm taking you tonight. I mean, I'm trying to drive a point home, ladies and gentlemen, that none of us know what the expiration date is. Amen. 
We had an elderly lady say the other day, in an attempt to make some comfort, she said, hey, you know when we're born, the Lord stamps an expiration date on us. Okay. When is it? You and I don't know. There's no way for us to be able to figure that out. All we know is, is that whatever that date is, I need to be ready for it. See, it's easy to be ready for the date if you know when it is. But if we're like most people, we wait till the last minute to prepare for it. If you knew when the date was, you'd be getting ready right before the date. You've been planning to get married a long time. This is part of what comes with sitting here. <laughs> but before you met her, you weren't planning a wedding. She might have been. She's been planning it since she was about 12. In her mind, she's got it drawn up. Get used to that. It doesn't change after 45 years. Do you understand? You will do things at the last minute the rest of your life. She will have already planned it out 20 years ahead of time. She's running a clock on you right now. Get used to it. He ain't changing. Can I get a witness? Come on, fellas. Help me out. Don't leave me twisting out here in the breeze. Y'all are like... I don't know nothing about that. Oh, yeah, you wait till the last minute. You take that big old number 12 or number 13 and shove that garbage down a little deeper in the can. Because garbage don't come for a couple more days. Well, let's not waste a good bag, right? No, you just don't want to go take it outside to the trash. Because she told you to. She ain't in charge. You are. You take the garbage out. No, I mashed it down. And then, lo and behold, it's time to take it out. And you're not there. And she goes to get it out. And it's hung on the aluminum in there where you stomped it down. And it tears the bottom of the bag out. You didn't make good plans. The better plan for you to do is, is you should have just gone ahead and took it out. And let me just go ahead and tell you right now, even if you take it out this week on time and do it without being told, there is always next week. <laughs> just because you do it once does not an eternity make. Praise the Lord. Ladies, I'm sorry. It's just a man thing. Honey, the roof's leaking. I need to go help my neighbor fix his roof. <laughs> Honey, our roof's leaking. Okay, well, put a bucket out. I've got to go help out someone. I could like almost bump you on that one. I, but can I say this to you? When it comes time to check the silk, when it comes time to go the way of everybody else, as David says to Solomon, where are you going to be when that time comes? The staff with Jacob had always been there. He just had taken it for granted. Always reliable. Always there where he can lean on that thing. Where there, there, there is someone there that he can constantly lean on that's helped him to get through his life. Even the last 13 or so years after he shows up, or 17 or so years after he shows up over in Egypt... He's leaning on his staff. Can I say this? Look, if you will, please, in the passage in Genesis 45. Make it 47. Jacob lived in a land, verse 28, of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in, burying, in, the, in the burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said, and swear unto me. And he swore unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. He's getting ready to die. He hears all of a sudden, when you get down to chapter number 48, he hears all of a sudden that his son Joseph is coming. He's laying there in the bed. He's, he's at the end. He's coming down to the end of everything. There's still some unfinished business that needs to be done. And notice, I think it's in verse number 2 there. In verse number 2, he hears that Joseph is coming to visit him. Yep. And notice what that visit does. 
it encourages him. It strengthens him enough for him to, to sit up. For him to say, oh, my boy's coming. I, I, can, I can get a little bit more strength. You know, you would be surprised when the time comes just helping show up just a little visit, a little word of encouragement. Be surprised how much strength they draw from that. You say, what is that? It's a staff. It's a staff to lean on. It's knowing that you do matter in other people's lives. Whether they accept the fact you're trying to help or not, it makes a difference when you take time to go out of your way to recognize, hey, they're about to be gone. You say, what does it do? It strengthens them. They call it a rallying point. And most of you that have been around any amount of death at all, you've seen individuals, especially under individuals that are under hospice care. And then all of a sudden, they, they're coming to the very end of everything, and they just seem to come out of this sort of comatose, sleepy-fied state. They haven't been eating, they haven't been drinking, uh, they're breathing real shallow, and they've got those long-term intermittent things. They're not quite rattling yet, but they're getting close. And then all of a sudden, it's like, they snap out for a second, sit up and go, Hey, how you doing? I'm hungry. I want something to eat. Where's Johnny? Where's Billy? Where's Susie? Where's that? And they start calling around. And you're like, Oh, well, they're healed. No, they're just saying goodbye. It's the last moments before they wind up going. It's that, it's that Joseph is coming. Jesus is coming. And I'm coming to get you. And I got just enough strength to be able to rise up one more time. And to be able to say what needs to be said. So then I'm ready to go. How much better not to wait till the last minute. But they call it a rallying point. I've seen it a multitude of times. And, I, and I, you hear like, you're like, you don't know, it's not a miracle. So you're just like, okay. You know, I've learned this about when people are dying in the South, a uh, dying. I've learned the best thing you can do is nothing. Amen. Literally, just stand there. Amen. What do you think? Amen. I don't know. I'm glad I'm here with you. Glad I have the privilege of sharing this moment with you. Glad to know that he's in the Lord's hand, she's in the Lord's hand, they are in the Lord's hand, whatever pronoun you want to use there. I'm glad to know that Jesus is on the way. Jesus is the one that's coming to get them. And that the Lord will give them the strength to cross the final Jordan. Things that you and I cannot do. Amen. Amen. I'm reminded of that story. Used so many times, but there's a great illustration of a little girl dying of leukemia. And she's mad and her mom and dad are there in the rocking chairs they had brought in and, and she's there in that cold hospital room and she's scared, obviously, and she's crying and she said, Daddy, I want you to go with me. And her daddy said to her, Honey, I'm so sorry. I, this is not a trip that Daddy can make for you and I can't go with you. If I could, I would. And she got mad. Do you know that when people are dying, they act out of character? I learned that about dying people. I was with an elderly lady when she was dying. There was no one else around. And so I got tagged and I went over there and I'm just sitting there with her. And man, I'm telling you, she's like, I never heard that before. Not out of her. But she was passing. It had something to do with something that happened before I ever even knew who she was. And this little girl, she's mad. Scared. She turns over her face to the wall. And mom and dad hold each other's hand and they begin to cry. Such a sad time when somebody is going at an untimely time. And they're crying. And after about an hour, the little girl turned back over and her whole countenance was different. And the daddy immediately came off the rocking chair and got down there by her bed and took her by the hand and got on his knees and said, Honey, I'm... I am so sorry. I, if I could go, I would go. And if I could take your place, I would take your place. And the little girl, without even missing a moment, she looks up at her daddy and she says, Oh, daddy, that's okay. Oh, Jesus told me He'd be here to take me over. Amen. Joseph showed up and Joseph is coming. And it gave Jacob, in spite of his past and the things that he had not always done right and all the sorrow and all of the sadness and all of the sickness and everything that had happened, he heard some good news from a far country. Hey, Joseph is coming. Amen. Amen. And with that, he strengthened himself. He 
leaned on his staff. He was able to draw himself up one last time. So much so, I have to say this, this is a great part of the story. He gained so much strength from realizing that Joseph was coming. Picture Jesus, you get that, surely. And so he gets so much strength from that. He says, where's your boys? He said, who, who are these? He said, Daddy, these, uh, he's from the South, Diddy. Diddy, he said, these are my boys. He said, my grandkids? He said, well, yes, sir. Man, you got to be kidding me. He said, bring them up here. I want to bless them. He already blessed his sons. Reuben, unstable as water, and all the other stuff. He goes down through all the tribes that are through that thing, and Judah, and the scepter, and never depart from thee, and Joseph, you'll be fruitful. And I can't remember all the things there in that passage on the left-hand page there, but he comes down through there. No, this is grandkids. Something about grandkids when you get old. You, you, you like them better. Because you look at them and say, how did that come out of that? <laughs> but you also feel a little bit vindicated. Because everything that your kids said they would never do like you, they're doing exactly like you did it. Yeah. Yeah. And the kid's giving them the same pay. And you're in your back of your mind, you're going, payback, payback. I'm just telling you, this is what it felt like. But he's so strengthened by knowing what's coming in the future. He's able to bless him in the present. And that blessing carries on even to this day. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm telling you that if the rapture doesn't happen, every one of us are going to be in the position of Jake. We're all going to have to give a testimony. What a terrible thing to be called to a hospital room or to be called to a bedside and, and, and the testimony to be unfinished business. Things that need to be cleared off the table. I mean, there is a lot to be said for dying in peace. Yeah. I'm not talking about you didn't get to play Augusta or something or you didn't get to buy a boat or you didn't get to buy a Ferrari. or I'm not talking about carnal stuff like that. I'm talking about the relationships that while you're still here, you have time to fix them. Don't wait until it's too late. It's not worth it in eternity. Let it go. Many times I've been told, I've seen it to be true, not enough to write a book on it, but I've been told I've been to all kind of courses and classes and different things like that that they try to tell you how to help the dying and, and so on and so forth. I've always found the best way to help the dying is just to be there. Tell them what the book says because you're speaking out of turn. You ain't died yet. You don't have all the answers. So you can't be like, oh, I know how it feels. Really, you've been dead? When Jim was a dying, he was laying up there in that bed and we were talking about 3 o'clock in the morning. We had a great time together, man. I'm so glad he let me be a part of that. We just fixed it where the Lord was there and we were just talking. He said, AP. Hey, I said, yeah. He said, you reckon how it'll be? I said, reckon how what it'll be? He said, when I die. And he said, you, th you think my, my heart will stop? Be an elephant sitting on my chest. Reckon my lungs will fill up and I'll drown. Reckon I'll be talking out of my head. He named off about six things. I said, Jim, I don't know. But I know that Paul said God's grace is sufficient. And I said, I'll be honest with you, Jim. If I see you going through all that, he said, put a bullet in my head. I said, no. But I'm not even so sure that the Lord won't have already taken you out. And that's just the throes of your final flesh trying to struggle. But I said, I'm sure God will get you through that. Yeah, he said, well, I'm sure of that too. But you know, at that time, everything you've ever believed. I mean, we believe it now. 
I know in whom I am believing and persuaded he is able to keep me against that day. Nothing can keep me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus my Lord. I mean, height or depth nor angels, principalities, power, things are under things come. Things that, I, I, nothing can keep me from that. I know the verses, but man, when you are going through, could it be today? Man, you, don't, you have no idea. I can't speak with any authority to that. But there is something to be said for having the slate cleared. Not having to wait. So I've been, I've been around. I've seen people wait till certain people came. At least that's what they said. And they said goodbye. You know what they said? You have to tell them. It's all right for you to go. See, well, that kind of sounds silly. No, some of us are so selfish. I did that to my dog. I, it was selfish. He should have been gone about a year before then. I couldn't let him go. Bring a shot over there to shoot him. Then they're telling me, well, you know, take him out and shoot. I can't shoot my dog. I can't. I can't. That's a good dog, man. I'd rather shoot a per. I can, no, I'm not. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> But because I couldn't turn loose, I made that dog suffer. Man, when that doctor came over there and put that little needle in, ah, I already dug the hole because I'm a man. I'm ready. And go lay over there in the hallway and she said, I'm going to put this in to relax him. I'm like, ma'am, I think he's like a little too relaxed. I think he's like already gone. She goes, that's how close he was to going. She put in that little bit and I picked that dog up, man. As soon as I picked him up, you know, he's just hanging there. And I rolled him up like this and his head fell right over here on my shoulder. <laughs> I was bawling like a little girl, man, over a dog. Well, preacher, what's it like? Well, when somebody goes, sometimes you know what they do? They wait until you clear accounts with them. Yep. Yes. What a terrible thing to have that on your mind when it comes time to die. Yes. An old woman, I think her name was Agnes. She was dying. Her friend, I don't remember her name, came to visit her because they had had a set to with each other for a number of years and she came in and she said can I see Agnes and she said sure come on in and she came in there and immediately she felt her bristle a little bit and she said oh Agnes I'm I'm begging you please forgive me I'm I'm so sorry for what I did and can we can we please I I hate for you to meet our maker and have this on you and Agnes said I forgive you and they prayed and had a little bit of a camp meeting there by her bed and she got ready to go. She got to the door and put her hand on the door and she said, hey, I keep wanting to say her name was Brenda. I can't remember. She said, hey, Brenda. She said, yes, Agnes. What can I do for you? Anything I can do for you. I just want you to know, Brenda, if I recover from this, I'm taking it all back. <laughs> wow. I've seen people wait. Till somebody shows up. Yes, I've seen them wait for somebody to leave. Not the way you might think. But because they don't want their loved one to see them pass, I've seen them hold on until that person leaves the room, gets in the parking lot, and gets in the car, and is pulling out of the parking lot. You say, what? Well, they're trying to do you a service. Yes, amen. It's not something for everybody to see. You say, but it's special, but it's not for everybody. You don't need to have any guilt on you for not being able to be there. Hey, they're the one that's dying. Don't make it about you. Right. Amen. Jake's coming to the end of his life. Don't know what all's going on, but he's thinking now, I think, he's looking at his past. You know what I think he's thinking? Man, God has been good to me. Yeah. My name was Jacob. And now I'm Israel. And in spite of some of my boys being messed up as a soup sandwich, I got Joseph and he's doing right and I got grandkids. And man, God's been good to me. You know how Jacob's going out? He's going out blessing other people while he's leaving. Man, what a way to go. Come in here, boy. 
Yes, sir. Bring me them kids. Daddy, you've gotten mixed up here. It's supposed to be the other way around. No, son, there's something went on a long time ago. <laughs> and the younger is going to definitely do more than the older. And this is how God wants it done now. You just let God take care of this thing. I, I'm in touch with God now. The way I did it before wasn't right. I'm going to fix that. See, teaching Joseph at the last minute, are you with me? Something that it took him a lifetime to learn. The first time I took it upon myself to do it my way and God had the whole thing figured out. So Jake says to Joseph, son, you better let me take care of this and he blesses him. And then he makes him make a promise. He says to him, uh, swear, put your hand under my thigh, that's just a, a, a strength, he said, and promise me you're not going to leave me in Egypt. Can I say this? They let Jacob die in, his, in Egypt. But you read down the next couple of verses and the Bible says that they embalmed him and they took him to another country. Well, that's odd. You say, what? That's a picture of eternal security. That you may die in Egypt, but you go into the promised land. Oh, preacher, you got to be... Oh, they embalmed him. If he had died anywhere else, he wouldn't have had the benefit of being involved, being, can I use the word, preserved? They preserved him until they got him back to the place where he said, hey, that's where I buried the rest of my family. That's the family cemetery. That's where I put the woman down that I love. Take me back to that place, the place that God promised me, right outside of Bethel. Been nice being down here for 17 years. But after I'm dead and gone, boy, don't leave me in Egypt. Can I say this to you if you're lost just real quick? You're going to die in Egypt and you don't have to worry about being carried anywhere. You will immediately drop into hell and you'll burn to the end of the millennial kingdom and then you'll be brought up at the great white throne and you'll get to give an account and after a thousand years or more of burning in hell, you think you're going to come up and be Mr. Positive? Or you think you're going to come up with a bunch of accusations against God? And after that, you know what he's going to say? Depart from me, you cursed in an everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and they're going to bind you hand and foot and toss you into the lake of fire, and you're going to be there till God dies. You say, what are you telling me about now? Hey, all of us that are here that are saved, I don't know when or where we're going to go, but I know we ain't staying here. You say, why? I've been preserved. I've already been embalmed. I'm, I'm, in, I'm inside, I'm embalmed. You don't have to worry about it. You say, why? You know what happens when you embalm people? They don't stink anymore. They don't rot anymore. I don't know if you've ever seen the process. I don't recommend you do it. I, I've already warned you. You don't need to know all this stuff and see all this stuff. But when they take those little rods and put them in your femoral arteries and they start that machine, it, I could recognize it right now. You could crank it up right now and say, I know exactly what that is. When they start that machine and on that steel table, when all that starts coming out, running toward that drain and stuff like that, I mean, it's red and sometimes it's black and sometimes it's kind of off-colored and stuff like that. I hadn't seen any green yet, but I've seen that going in there. And then all of a sudden, that color that you have in the palms of your hand, everything begins to change. You say, why? Well, you get your color from the blood. It nourishes everything. The life of the flesh is in the... Blood. And so when they start pumping that out, guess what happens? That blood, because it's no good, it causes every part of you to wind up dying and it can rot and it stinks and it's disease-filled. And once they replace that with formaldehyde, that's what it is. Like you used to put frogs in in school, if they still do that. Once they put that in you, you can go dig them back up. You know a weird thing? When you dig them back up after they've been there a while, their hair still grows and their nails still grow. Until their skin finally falls off. Ain't that weird? I mean, I don't think it grows on a bald person, but I'm just... <laughs> but you won't care, you're already preserved. That literally was ex cathedra. Sorry, just like <laughs> jumped right out there. <laughs> Excuse me. Brad is so glad y'all are here. 
This is the cheap seats. <laughs> but listen to me. The time came. And the Bible says that they wept for 40 days. They grieved him for 40 days. You say, why? No matter the opinion of yourself, he was great to a lot of other people. You know what Joseph said? If it hadn't been for Daddy, I'd have never been here. And in spite of Daddy doing some jack-legged things, I'd have never been here. We would have never seen what God's done here in Egypt. So I can at least be grateful for that. The Bible said they wept 40 days. And then Joseph said, okay, we're done now. How will it be when it comes time for you to go? Are you ready now? See, we kind of, me included, map it out. About how many years we have. I tell the guys 10, they say maybe 5. But, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know how long I got. But, but I, in my mind, I don't allow for certain idiosyncrasies. Car accidents. Disease. Heart attacks. Any, any number. Of, I don't allow for that. I'm, I'm thinking, everything's going to continue tomorrow like it is today. Really? Who, who knows that? But you see, we've had so many tomorrows that are like today's that we think that's how it's going to be. And before long, we're lulled to sleep and we think we have time and we think we have time and we read our Bible and we pray, but we grow stale. And before long, instead of thinking, hey, what if today is the day? Am I now ready? Not just for salvation. You say, what happened? I think... Jake gets to the end of his life. He realized he'd been leaning on the staff. You read that passage over there in Hebrews 11, the passage that we're at here. You know what the last word in that thing? It's not Jacob. You know what the last word in Hebrews 11 is? It's staff. You know what you're going to find when you get to the end of your life? It's always been about the staff you've been leaning on. It's always been about the Lord. It's never been about you and I in the first place. Amen. It's all been about, in spite of who you are, God saw you as something greater than you could ever imagine yourself to be. And in a lifetime, God was able to do something with somebody. If you had given them that start, you would have said, there's no way they'll ever amount to anything. But the Lord changed His name from Jake to Israel. Israel looks back. He says to Pharaoh, he said, uh, he's leaning upon his staff. Yeah, Pharaoh, the reason I'm here, few and evil have been the years of my pilgrimage. But let me tell you about what I've been leaning on. Let me tell you about the person this represents. Let me tell you how wonderful it is to every time I take a step, I have to lean on that staff because I realized before that, I was on my own. I sure am grateful for that staff. And the Bible said he lifted up his legs. Drew up. You ever seen them do that when they get ready to pass? You ever seen them draw up? It's almost like they go back in the fetal position. I'm almost done. Have you ever seen that? They, they draw up. They start eating like little birds. If at all. And they stop drinking. And they kind of disconnect from the rest of the world. And it's almost womb-like. It's almost baby-like. It's, it's really strange. Now, I'm not talking about sudden. I'm just talking about when they're, when they're going, they start drawing up. And then the next thing you know, they're drawing up just like they were when they were a little baby. You say, I wonder why. Because somebody's got to take them through to the other side. They can't make it on their own. And the father who says, when mother and father... Forsake me, the Lord will take me up. You know what he does? He comes down at a time when no one else can get you across that river. Scoops you up. Says, I got you. 
What do you think that's like, preacher? Oh, I think it's kind of like me picking up Zeke. I think all of a sudden, head just rests on his shoulder and... You know what they call it? They call it rest. When my dad was passing, he was a dying. We were at hospice, 8th and Jefferson, right across from the old county hospital. Wednesday night about 9 o'clock. I remember my mama going in and telling my dad. I told her, I said, Mama, I, I really believe he's getting close. You need to let him know it's okay to go. Everybody had been there visiting. It was about the time for church to get out on a Wednesday night. I was apropos. And he gets there, or she gets there, and she leans over and she says, I know you're tired. She said, you go on over to the other side and rest. I'll be there directly. It wasn't two, three minutes. Big deep breath. And then he let it out and it just kept coming out and just kept coming out. Just kept coming out. A little bit of a rattle and then and I'm standing there. My mama's sitting right here. My dad's here and I'm standing right here and I'm right here by him. I was holding his hand and I took his hand like this and I was crying. I was crying. I'm glad to see him not suffering anymore. I was crying because I was going to miss him. I was crying because of the hurt and the pain. The nurse came in and she looked at me and she said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, just waving goodbye. Richie, you don't know if he saw you. Yeah, you don't know if he didn't. But what a way to go. The example he set, 64 years of age, he was ready. Jim, 54 years of age, he was ready. The old preacher, right at 94, he was ready. But everybody don't make 94. What happens when it's time for you to pass? Are you ready? If not, do you think maybe now would be a good time to make those arrangements? I mean, I'm not talking about just call the funeral home and put whatever box you're going to put together in the vault, all the other. I'm not talking about that. That stuff don't matter. And those of you worried about that, you ain't going to be here. You don't need to worry about it. But can I say this to you from a spiritual standpoint? Are you ready? How will you go out? Well, just before my dad died, and I'm done, we're still at the hospital, downtown Baptist. They still have us over in the ER, ICU area of the ER thing over there. He's behind a curtain. You know, I'm talking to him, carrying on a conversation. And he gave me some specific instructions about things. And I had enough wisdom to fill a thimble or at least half a thimble. And here I am as a young man trying to talk a dying man into all this like I know what it's like. I said, well, Dad, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, all this kind of stuff. He said, hey, boy. Whenever he said that to me, that meant you need to shut up and listen. He's playing the dad card. <laughs> hey, boy, you better listen to me now. I said, yes, sir. He gave me that instruction and he said, son, all that matters now, no matter what you may think of all the lifetime you've been around me for the short life you've lived here, all they're going to remember is how I finished. And anything I might have done can be destroyed right now because I do something stupid at the last minute. That's somebody who's thinking way down the road. But that's also somebody that says, you know something? When it comes your time, unless they're just real ogres, they're not going to be concerned about all the stuff you did in the past. You know what they're going to do? They're going to watch how you go and embrace the future. 
And God ordained it that way. Every saint in the Bible died. Why? Well, preacher, there's... Oh, okay. I know there's a couple of illustrations. I know Elijah, whirlwind. I get that. I know Enoch. I understand that. But listen to me. Every saint died. Why? Because here's what the Lord says about when it comes your time. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. I believe that's called a personal pronoun, His saints. When you got saved, you belong to Him. You know what He said? When that time comes, He doesn't say, precious is the life of the saints. Precious is the living of the saints. Precious is the tithing of the saints. Precious is the church. Of the, precious is the faithfulness of the saints. Precious is that. You know what He said? Precious is the death of the saints. Are you ready? Preacher doesn't get as old as you. I guess I better get ready. Yeah, but there's no guarantee you won't get that old. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.